welcome to the Comics Cube. Today, uh, we got a tape that we putting out uh, all about Max Fleischer's Superman. So if you down with it, you down with us. Let's go. All right, what are we doing? Uh, you got a whole agenda here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got all kind of good stuff here, man. Um, I think the place I wanted to start, you know, because we always try to go back as far as we can and bring it up. So uh, let's go back to when we all were children and the first time we actually saw uh, this cartoon. I, I was kind of curious about, like, the different formats that people saw it in. So, because, uh, you know, we, we live, all of us are, like, in different parts of the world, so, you know, things are different. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, when we first saw it, where we first saw it, and the format that we saw it on. Um, uh, uh, Paulie, I'm going to start with you, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, interestingly, I didn't see it until any of those cartoons until I was, I don't know, maybe about 18, 19, maybe a bit older. Like when I was a kid, uh, the only real Superman cartoon I ever watched was the Ruby Spears one. Mm. And I loved that, but I, I didn't even know the 1940s one existed. And then I think a friend put a couple of them on a tape for me, I think, when I was around early 20s, late teens. And the thing that struck me the most from watching them was that I couldn't believe that what I was watching had been made in the early 40s. Uh, you know, it was something I had to double check. It just blew my mind that something that looked like that was so old. Um, and I think it was the first one as well that I saw, um, the one that's just called Superman or the Mad Scientist or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so you it's can imagine that Superman, one. The... Yeah, there's like four yes. mad scientists throughout this whole series. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all mad scientists. Yeah. Not <laughs> any of them are Lex Luthor. No. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> but I mean, that first one looks particularly amazing, I think. So, I mean, it left such an impression on me when I watched it. So, yeah, I never had a childhood experience with it, though. I did. Um, and I can't really tell you how or when or what episode it was. But my family at a video store. This was in the time of Betamax. I, I definitely, I definitely absolutely remember that intro. Um, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound in that exact voice. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I, and I know that only really came from like two things. It was that or the George Reeves uh, show. And I absolutely did not watch the George Reeves show. Like I didn't see an episode of the George Reeves show until I was in college when I was in the U.S. Um, so it's definitely that. I don't remember what episode it was, but and you know, to me, it was just a cartoon that I watched as a kid. But when I moved to the states for college, so one time I was in Walmart, and I saw going for a dollar all episodes of the Superman 1940s Fleischer cartoon, and I was like, oh, this is a dollar. I got to go get this then. It's like, it's worth it. So you start mm -hmm. playing it and I couldn't stop playing it. It was amazing. Specifically for that reason, Paul, I was like, what? This was made in the forties. That's impossible. <laughs> it, it's so good. And um, I think even at the time, uh, I'd been hearing a lot about like the mechanical monsters like that mm -hmm. e episode. I, I want to feel, I want to, I feel like that episode is the most famous I don't really have anything to back that up, but I kind of feel that it is uh, because I feel like I heard about it a lot. So, yeah, it was uh, – I definitely saw it when I was a kid, but I definitely appreciated it more when I rediscovered it in college. One dollar DVD Walmart. <laughs> wow. That, <clears throat> yeah, college. I mean, you know, that's what it's like. I mean, when you're in college, you broke. You know what I mean? So, so any kind of deal, no matter what it is, you're going to go for it, you know? But yeah, I mean, you talk about uh, value for your buck, a dollar for the whole series. Man, that's crazy, you know? I think they might have omitted a couple of the politically incorrect episodes. Those were yeah. uh, yeah. the Japatours and uh, Jungle Drums. Yeah, yeah, uh, which they should have. <laughs> what about you? What about you, Lamar? What was your... Uh... Uh, let me see. 
it's funny because <clears throat> when it comes to stuff like this, I can remember things like the the year and all of that. Uh, with this one, I could tell you right now, uh, the first time I saw it, it was 1983. I was four years old, and uh, we didn't have cable where I lived at yet because uh, it hadn't come out that way because I lived in a rural community. So <clears throat> we it would come on sometimes like, it's almost like sometimes like, you know, television is different now, right? Cause you have programming, right? Yeah. So you can kind of just set in a logarithm and just let it roll. But <clears throat> in those days, you actually had to have somebody who would like switch tapes out and reels out and all this kind of stuff and make sure the signals were always running and all of that. It was a more elaborate operation in regards to keeping it functional. So I remember one time the local television station apparently they had some sort of like thing going on with the programming or like it could have just been somebody a hey, just didn't come to work that day right so <clears throat> to fill in the gap like it was dead air for like two minutes and so to fill in the gap they just started running these and the first one that they ran was um i think it's it's the fifth uh the fifth episode the bulleteers okay with the with the bar Oh my gosh, man. When when that car comes like out of nowhere and it just goes <laughs> man <laughs> like I think about it now, man, I just start giggling, man. But that cartoon was great. And then um I was just uh I remember later <clears throat> I had started studying like the Roman numerals because they didn't really teach that when I was in school. So I just kind of studied it on my own. And so I was looking at like the dates for things. Cause you know, back then a lot of times they would have the dates in Roman numerals on stuff. So, and so I was like, wait a minute. Uh, 1942. Like, like I had the same reaction you guys did. <clears throat> you know, I was like, exactly. wow, this, you know, this cartoon, I, but you know, that was the eighties. So the cartoon was 40 years old. And I'm thinking, you know, at the time, you know, my, my, my mother, peace be upon her. She's an ancestor now. She, uh, she wasn't even 30, you know, so, so it's like the cartoon was older than my mom, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta figure something out with this. And this is when, um, uh, VHS was starting to take over Betamax. Mm -hmm. So you started seeing these video stores, like the mom and pop stores. We didn't have Blockbuster or anything like that. So, uh, the mom and pop video shops was coming up and I went in there maybe two years later. And um, they had it in there, like on a double tape. And so I would rent that tape every single weekend. And I would run through the entire thing every single weekend, you know? Um, and it just, it blew my mind, man. Like, I, I can't even tell you. I, I think other than, other than um, Christopher Reeve in the first Superman movie, um, this was like the one for me that was just like, yeah, Superman is my favorite fictional character, not just comic book character. He's my favorite fictional character, you know? And a lot of it is because of this, of this, um, of, uh, this uh, series. Superman means so much to all of us. And I, I just think it's funny because every time we do one of these, we're always like, when did you first like read this or watch this or something? And my answer is always like, I can't remember. Cause like mm -hmm. Superman's been a, such a part of my life for such a, since I was born, basically, mm -hmm. it's just, it all just kind of blends together. And the thing too is like, this cartoon in the 80s, like you were watching it in the 80s, it looked so much better than anything from the 80s. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. it did. You know, like, in, in, in fact, the two cartoons I think about when it comes to like those comparisons with the animation and stuff, um, I think about Max Fleischer's Superman and I think about Johnny Quest, um, you know, from the 60s. Like mm. those cartoons still today look better than pretty much anything, you know, since for the most part. You know, it's amazing. Um, uh, do you guys have any uh, favorite episodes or like even if it's just a bunch, it doesn't have to be one, just, you know. Yeah, I got two favorite episodes. Um, the Bulleteers is one, actually. Because mm -hmm. uh, I like, like I just finished reading Superman Smashes the Clan. And Oh, excellent book. Yeah. It's a great book. Everybody should read it. 
Uh, and I like the idea. I like the aesthetic. First of all, I like the aesthetic. I like the 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 S shield with the black background. Mm-hmm. Really like it a lot. But I like the aesthetic of a Superman who can't fly and is not that strong. Mm-hmm. So you know how in the Bulleteers, and you know that Superman does not work in a shared universe. Right. Yeah. He, he yeah. cannot be just that in a shared universe. But in a standalone thing, like it's really appealing. And you know how in the Bulleteers he's trying to stop all of these kind of missiles and everything uh, Mm -hmm. from the air. And he's not doing that thing that you would normally see Superman do where he's just kind of pushing against it like while in flight because he can't. He's trying to, he's trying to control or steer it and everything Mm -hmm. using just his strength. And so I thought that was really cool. Uh, And the other one that's my favorite is Volcano. Yeah, Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. And I like it because uh, so Lois Lane gets in trouble in every episode except for the last one, which where she doesn't show up for some reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lois Lane gets in trouble, and but the thing is, she gets in trouble because she's such a good reporter. Mm-hmm. Like she puts herself in those situations, and yes, she does need saving because these are super extreme situations, and she's a normal human being. But there's a mm-hmm. spot in Volcano where she has to. She has to. She hangs from the cable of a cable car, and she just makes her way to the cable car. And I feel like this was unheard of for a female character in 1941. Yes, 1942. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I I think that was. So those are my two favorite episodes for for that reason. Uh, well, you. Yeah, Paulie, what you got, man? Uh, I think um, the first one. I love Superman because that was the first one I saw. I think that's the most beautiful looking. And um, I really like that one because um, something I've talked to you both uh, um, not off the recording about is I've been watching a lot of the Fleischer Popeye cartoons. And that mm. one's quite reminiscent of the Popeye Fleischer cartoons, I think, maybe because mm. that was their first one, first foray into Superman cartoons. So they were still using some of the Popeye tropes. But the Vulture who's the sidekick of the scientist. And there's this bit where, um, I don't know if it's Lois knocking on the door or something their machine is doing, their um, electronasia ray or whatever it's called, (laughs) making this sort of rhythmic noise. And as this rhythmic sound happens, the scientist and the vulture are sort of, (laughs) they, they raise in their chair in tune with the rhythm and that's very sort of like Popeye Betty Boop kind of uh, <laughs> thing that and the vulture itself is, is very reminiscent of those cartoons and also and I think this is something I was talking about with Doi off the recording a couple of weeks ago and um, when he's punching the electric ray <laughs> you know <laughs> I love it that is, that is so Popeye when he's just punching the ray <laughs> it makes no sense the yeah. ray on hitting him. This this laser ray keeps on hitting him, and, and like to just to just to beat it, he just starts punching it. I yeah. love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that one, and because of just basically because it, it's the one that's most it's the most beautiful looking one, and it's the one that's most like a Popeye cartoon. You know what else? The, you, know what, uh, you know what else happens in yeah. that one? The building starts toppling over, and bends in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> it bends in the middle, and Superman just pushes it back, so it is straight up, and then it bends forward that way, and then it just kind of wobbles back into place. Because that's how buildings work, kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's one thing too. I'm glad you said that because in this in this cartoon, uh, physics is not something that's constant. Mm-hmm. It changes from moment to moment, and that's just how it works in this in this in this thing. And so this is not the kind of show for you if you're so cynical and pragmatic that you're like, you know how I know that's a fake? That can never happen. It's a cartoon. That's how you know it can never happen, right? This is not the show for you. I'm just going to be honest with you right now. Don't watch this because (laughs) um, physics is constantly rewriting itself in this from moment to moment, episode to episode. And that's the beautiful thing about it to me. And they sell it so well just because it's so well animated. So Absolutely. like when I saw that when I saw that the first time again in, in college and I saw like you know the wobbling building, I was like, well that's that's weird. But now like I think about it and it's like there's no way that has to have been intentional. Mm. 
So, but again, I think it's this sort of cartoon aesthetic where you look at the sort of Popeye and Betty Boop cartoons, and you've got buildings bobbing along with the uh, <laughs> with the music as if they're made out of jelly or something. And exactly, that thing isn't it? Yeah, um, exactly. The yeah. other yeah. favorite is uh, the Eleventh Hour. And oh, I really like that if it's the one I'm right one I'm thinking of because that one actually starts with Clark and Lois. They've already been kidnapped by the Japanese, and so you're right there in the middle of something right away. And Superman is in the midst of breaking out of his cell and sabotaging all these war machines, and he's been doing it for a few weeks. And I really like that one because it's a break with the formula that most of them stick to. That they all kind of start in the same way. Something happens in the same way. Usually, a mad scientist, and then it ends in the same way with uh, Clark Kent winking at the camera. But this one, it starts with them. They're in a Japanese prison. Uh, Clark and Lois are Superman sabotaging all these machines, and then at the end of it, Lois has escaped, but Clark's still in Japan. And all the reporters are going, Lois, where's Clark? And she's like, oh, I don't know, he's still there. Superman will rescue him. I don't care. <laughs> so I find that quite... <laughs> but also, that's what... And I think this is something we're going to discuss later on, but you can really see in the 11th hour how Frank Miller was influenced by these cartoons because a lot of Superman dismantling these weapons is really reminiscent of those Superman scenes in Dark Knight Returns. I see it, yeah. um, yeah, the way uh, the way so, he draws Superman too. Absolutely, yeah. So for that reason as well, that that one really stood out to me. You know, my favorite part of the eleventh hour is the fact that when he's breaking in and out of prison, he just removes the bars, <laughs> puts it down, leaves, <laughs> comes back, puts the bars back on. Like it's been. <laughs> I love it. There's like such a surreal layer to this whole thing. It's so realistically animated and drawn and like fluid and everything. And, but like the surrealism of the physics is just like an added layer of, of awesome throughout the whole thing. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, you Lamar, you have a favorite episode. Oh man. Um, well, let me talk about this one first. Um, I don't have a particular favorite, like in an order, but I got to talk about it. Um, uh, the, um, what is the name? The Electric Earthquake. <laughs> Let me tell y'all something right now. For, for those of you who have not, not seen this, because we're not going to do the spoiler alert thing on a cartoon that's almost 100 years old. We're just not doing that, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of a policy on this show. So uh, um, this, the, of course, you have a mad scientist who's um utilizing this this elaborate contraption to create these earthquakes and because he has a machine that lets out these electrical charges or pulses or whatever and it causes these earthquakes and of course this is like a this is like a ransom scheme of course you know this is how these people get down right it's all about a buck you know you know stuff stays the same right so um the funny thing about this episode, though, is that when Superman figures out what's happening and he finds out that there's this elaborate electrical system that runs underground, he finds out that it actually runs under the ocean. So he goes down into the ocean to destroy the machine. And this is this and, and this Superman, he's particularly ham fisted. Right. So like everything that he that he encounters like this. He just starts like what you were talking about, about punching the lasers, right? He solves all all the problems that he has in these cartoons can be solved by smashing and hitting things, right? So, and (laughs) so he just goes down and starts pulling wires out of the machine and stuff. Now, keep in mind, he's underwater. There's the water's not electrified or any of that. He's just going down there and he's pulling these things out. If a normal person would have tried that, you'd be dead in seconds. <laughs> Even if you were strong enough to pull. He's in the middle of, of the ocean with, with hot electrical wires. You can't beat it. You know, it's <laughs> physics, baby. This is just how we get down, right? Yeah. So just the visuals of that is just, is, it's, it's amazing. Like even just looking at it now, it, it was just, this cartoon just in general, especially with the early ones, uh, like with the first seven or eight of them, you know, they're just breathtaking to watch even now. Um, 
I love that. And uh, what's the other one I like? Um, uh, the aforementioned uh, bulleteers. Uh, so I'm not I'm not going to go with that one. Um, the one um, it's um, uh, uh, the one with the circus. Uh, Terror on the Midway. There you go. That's the one. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh man. Um, it's, it's a whole bunch of crazy stuff going on. Um, like there's even a point where Lois is watching, you know, the clown thing Yeah. and the clowns are doing their thing. And then this, this monkey just comes out of nowhere and goes over to the gorilla cage and just opens the cage up. <laughs> like, and it's totally normal. You know, <laughs> like it, there's nothing out of place about this monkey just being like, yeah, we, we about to set it off real quick and going and opening the gorilla cage. Like it's not absurd at all, you know? I love um, it. <laughs> I love it. And, and, and we all know monkeys and apes and things like that makes everything better. Doesn't matter what it is. It, you know, if it's on a cartoon, a comic, anything, it's better. Put a monkey in it, put an ape in it, it's better, right? Um, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah 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 just some of the motifs like what paulie was saying a lot of the stuff like you see the um you can tell that those popeye cartoons and like those the, the movies and stuff were made by the same people because you see a lot of um a lot of the same motifs and stylistic choices and where they would put the absurd stuff you know, because in, in those Popeye cartoons, absurd things are happening constantly. All the time. Right? All the time. I mean, even when he gets up and opens a door, something wild is happening. So <laughs> with, with, with Superman, it's kind of like more rooted in a sense, as much as a guy running around in tights and punching lasers can be rooted. But when they put those moments in it, I don't know if they just went with feeling or whether it was strategic, but it was just well done. It's never out of place. It's amazing. You know, it's amazing. I love it. Uh, I'll point out also because you mentioned the electric earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, the villain in electric earthquake is a mad scientist who is a Native American. And mm -hmm. notable here is it's 1942. He's a Native American. He's wearing like a business suit. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not wearing feathers. He's not. It's just this is not what I expect from a 1942 cartoon. Right. I expect mm -hmm. I expect visual shorthand and a racist depiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. I, I think hats off to them for that, actually. Yeah. For, you know, at least not, you know, not taking it there, you know, because they, mm -hmm. I mean, they could have done that. And then uh, it would be, because honestly, uh, and it, see, it's funny to me, though, because uh, for those of you who don't know, the Fleischer brothers had a falling out. And so yeah. the production company changed it's about like half, halfway. halfway through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think starting with like episode 10, I think it switched up but uh that's when you start to see all of this other stuff you know with these um these uh racist depictions of you know indigenous peoples you know a lot of it you see it after that you especially know. the uh, japanese oh my god and for those of y'all who don't know what we're talking about the name of the episode is japa tours uh yeah it's basically a a um a Sorry. conflation of, of japanese and saboteurs, saboteurs. yeah so and it, it goes downhill from there. So, <laughs> so if you decide uh, to treat yourself, I'm just letting you know now. It's interesting because it, under Fleischer Studios, the first ten, uh, nine episodes, it was more like sci-fi, uh, you know, got a lot of robots, yeah. mad scientists. And then like mm -hmm. the second half under Famous Studios, oh, you got like, you know, they're in Japan, they're, they're fighting in the war, uh, there's spies, like it's just a change in direction. Mm-hmm. It's a weird trade-off, isn't it? Because with the famous studios ones, I think the plots are more interesting because like I was mentioning about the 11th hour, they mix it up a bit. They, they don't stick to the formula as much. But on the other hand, the animation isn't quite as good. It's not. And yeah. it it's suffers. It's like they're all super racist as well. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. so it's a weird yeah. trade-off. Yeah. Uh, uh, all I was telling you guys, like I was surprised, like there's this episode called The Mummy Strikes and there's a mummy and the mummy is portrayed as a black guy which is which was a little refreshing to me because normally you'd see a mummy uh, portrayed as a white guy mm -hmm. um and it wasn't that he, it wasn't even that he was drawn like you know like ebony white or 
or or a minstrel or anything. And I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of refreshing, even though he's a villain. And then the next episode is Jungle Drums. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, hey, like, aha, we got you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, yeah, you're right. That that sort of uh, depiction, even like what I was saying about Johnny Quest, for example, you know, there's a there's an episode that revolves around Kemet and, you know, the uh, the Sahe or, you know, what we call a mummy, because mummy is a um, is an Arabic term. But um, he's not really the, he's not really drawn in a particular way to, to let you know what he is or what he's not. But he kills all of the like the the villains and stuff like he just comes and he takes them and they're going through a door and he just kind of bam you know and they drop dead you know like it's kind of cool yeah. you know <laughs> but um but yeah um i think we've talked a little bit about um uh some of our favorite moments and stuff um the the thing about this this show is that the the supporting characters is pretty constant you know and it's it's a small um the, small the cast. Expect, yeah, yeah, it's a small cast. I think for a show like this, um, where you know it's all taking place like in in a universe and Superman is the only superhero, that kind of works out. Uh, it works out better if you ask me, as opposed to an extended supporting cast, especially considering that the the cartoons are are less than ten minutes long. Yeah. Um, we've talked a little bit about the the moments, but uh, we could talk about the uh, characters now, as far as any um any characters that may have stuck out to you for you know for better or for for worse it don't have to be your favorites or nothing uh do you want it you want to start yeah let's talk about lois uh lois is in er lois is in every episode but the last one which is really weird Mm -hmm. uh and in almost everyone like i just mentioned she gets in trouble but she gets in trouble because she puts herself in trouble yeah and she just has so much agency, especially for this is why Lois is the best love interest that's ever been created in, in superhero comics. Yeah. Lois gets in trouble because she puts herself in trouble. Like in the fourth episode, uh, which is, I think it's called the Arctic giant. Lois is in a train and there, there's a bunch of hijackers coming at her in a car. She just takes a machine gun and she straight up starts firing at them. And yeah. I want to say that's unheard of for a woman in 1941 or yeah. at least it's super rare. Um, and yeah, she gets in trouble and Superman has to save her uh, all the time, but that's mm-hmm. because she's a good reporter who's trying to get a story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, what about you, Paul? Who's your favorite super villain, Paul? In- <laughs> well, um, I've got. I, I want to talk in a minute about Lois again because I share your opinion of Lois. She's fantastic in these cartoons. I think my favorite of all the mad scientists they've got in these cartoons is the uh, magnetic telescope guy. Because. He's n- <laughs> I love him. I love him so much. Because <laughs> he's not really a villain. He's just a git. Because <laughs> like, because yeah. like, <laughs> like he, he, his magnetic telescope brings a, a comet to Earth, and the comet kind of rolls through the city into the sea and causes havoc. And like, every all the police are like, "Dude, you." Your telescope is bringing comets to it. He should probably stop. And he's like, nah, science. <laughs> like, I don't care about you people. I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> and for, like, for, for the benefit of science, I have to keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't care whose life I risk. You know? <laughs> I love him. <laughs> so yeah. he's my favorite because he's not evil. He's just, you know. <laughs> he just doesn't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, but I love Lois too for all the reasons they said. And it's really interesting seeing Lois in these cartoons and how, like how you say, she gets herself into trouble because she's such a great reporter because she's so brave and courageous. And that's kind of within 10 and that's in the comic as well in the 1940s comic she's like that mm-hmm. and by like the 1950s and the 1960s within like 10 years that's kind of morphed into oh lois is a pest 
and they actually describe her as a pest in the comic. And it's weird how like she this character is twisted by misogyny into this sort of caricature of what she used to be. And she's just someone who just blunders into trouble because she sticks her nose into it, you know, rather than someone who gets into trouble deliberately because she's so ruthless and relentless in pursuit of a story because she's so good at her job. Um, so it's really interesting in that context to see Lois in these cartoons, I think. Wow. Lamar? Um, yeah, well, we, we got, I got to go back to the, uh, the scientist uh, with the, with the, the magnetic telescope. Cause this guy, like, I'm trying to tell y'all, man, this dude is, is like, it's like Paulie said, this guy just, I mean, he's just total disregard for anything except for what he's doing is just, it's, it's magnificent almost to the point that it, it's kind of admirable. Like you kind of root for him a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he's career like, he wants to succeed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's like, yo, this dude, like, literally, this is what happens. Like, first of all, if you can imagine a comet being directed towards Earth with the magnetic telescope, and then the comet is just kind of like doing all the physics yet again, is just doing all of these little, he, it's like he's treating this comet, this comet like a stunt kite. That's the funny <laughs> thing about it, right? It's so then bad. when the cop, you know, when the cops go to him and they like, uh, they're like, hey, man, listen, man, you're going to kill everybody in the world, man. You need to cut this out. He like, what you mean? You know, like that's the funny thing about it. Like it's like, it's like, like what? I'm working here. Like yo, <laughs> you got to give me something better than that to get me to stop. I mean, because that's not good enough, man. I mean, you know. But um, I love that guy, man. And and um, you know, technically there is no law that says he cannot bring comments down Earth with his magnetic telescope. With magnetic telescope, so te <laughs> I mean, loophole. You know what I mean? I mean, they do it all the time. You know. So what you gonna do? You like know? that. Um, I'm sure people have seen this, this Spider-Man panel with mm -hmm. Spider-Man's talking and it's always on the internet and mm -hmm. it's Spider-Man talking to Sauron, this mad scientist <laughs> yeah. who up into a dinosaur <laughs> and Spider-Man saying to him like, you can change people's DNA, you can change people into dinosaurs, you know, why are you doing that? You can cure cancer. And he's like, I don't want to cure a cancer, I want to turn people into dinosaurs. Exactly. <laughs> And exactly. Like same energy. Love with it. Magnetic telescope guy. <laughs> you know, yeah, the same thing. Like, man, you know, ain't no love loss or nothing, man, but I got stuff to do. You know? <laughs> so, you know, like, it's definitely not personal with this dude. So, um, he's the best. Um, yeah, you know, and, you know, the other character I like too that's very understated is, um, is, you know, Perry White. Yeah. You know, because he's just kind of like, hey, listen, y'all come over here. And, he just puts stuff and be like, listen, this is what I need y'all to do. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I'll holler at y'all when y'all get back, you know, and that's it. Like, you, you know, so it's, it's kind of like, but it, it goes a long way to show. Obviously he trusts these people cause they get results. You know, Lois yeah. gets results because she's tenacious. Uh, she's apt at what she does. And like you said, she's very gung ho about, finding the truth in the world and those are admirable traits I, I mean anybody can look up to lois lane you know even anybody. you know you don't have to be a woman anybody even can. even clark kent yeah. clark kent looks i mean obviously because when, when we you go to um you you push it up a little bit you go into the 80s and the burn era like he pretty much admits as much that you know one of the things that that, that made him fall in love with her is her dedication to the truth and to her craft you know and so and with, you know, she gets results that way. Clark gets results that way. He's not a bad reporter, but he's also Superman, right? So yeah. <laughs> it's like the results are guaranteed. But, you know, but, but Perry is, um, the take on Perry here is probably my favorite because out of all the different medium, because uh, he pretty much is just like, hey, listen, this is where the stuff at. I don't care how you get it. Don't know what you're going to do to get it. Just get it, bring it back. Just do it. And uh, yeah, just do it. And then that's it. Right. And that's, that's what you need uh, in a, in a, in a cartoon like this and in a universe like this, because they keep getting results time and time and time again, you don't get in the middle of that, you know, and, and that's actually commentary that we could utilize today in an era of micromanagement and things like that. You know, I agree. There is, there is yeah. one episode where Perry is a bit of a get though. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is in in yeah. the underground world. I think it's called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at oh. the end, 
he kills Lois's story about the underground world because no one's going to yeah. believe it. But he yeah. actually sets fire to his story in front yeah. of it. But yeah, you know what? Yeah. The thing is, the <laughs> thing is, he's right. It's not publishable. He's right, but setting fire to it is a bit much. In front yeah, of it. <laughs> yeah, in front of the person that brought it to you. Like, man, man, I almost died several times getting this, and you just take it in. This was uh, this was in the area of the typewriter. If it's burned, it's gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's no, uh, there's no data recovery uh, nope. from, the, from the Geek Squad. You know what I mean? Like, no, nah, I don't work like that. And it, it's also worth noting that this was the next to the last episode after um, the company oh, yeah, switch yeah, yeah. and the Fleischer brothers had had it fallen out. But, um, yeah, yeah. but I, I also like to think. Well, we'll get to that later. I'll bring that up later. Um, All right. Let, let's deal with the uh, technical aspects and stuff of of the way that. Um, this cartoon ended up being what what it was and the innovations much like the the superman movie in 78 the um the technical aspects of this were just like earth shattering you know because we're talking oh about like a God. paradigm shift here yeah so um yeah let's get into that a little bit um uh Doyle, i'm gonna let you lead off on this one you know what word you would never use with superman that i'm gonna use here noir yeah, yeah. Like, mm-hmm. The lighting in this, the lighting in this show, is mind blowing. Like, just the way and like the fluidity because like it's rotoscope, right? So meaning that they filmed people and then they traced over it and made it animation. Mm-hmm. But the way that they added in the lighting was just the the mood is so set. It's um, it's just an mm-hmm. amazing. Cause like, I mean, it's five minutes long. So like one of the things you really have to do is get atmosphere set. And mm-hmm. the way that they set the atmosphere is just like, it's, it's set the moment you start because the moment you see them in the daily planet and then like, you know, the light is coming in or it's dark and you see all these shadows. It's like, you're already mm-hmm. intrigued. Mm-hmm. If this show was, if they utilize the exact same techniques and then they made it like the Clark and Lois show where they're just reporters, it would still be a captivating cartoon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Uh, just the lighting is just amazing to me. Yeah. Well, you guys. What you got, Paulie? Well, I think uh, the rotoscoping is the thing that um, stands out for me. And I'll, I'll admit, I do not know a lot about animation. I don't know a lot about how they done it, but I understand they're drawing over recordings of human figures. Yeah. I, think, I believe. And then they and, can warp it as much as they want. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that really adds something to the whole, to, to the whole thing. I mean, uh, I think with a character like Superman generally, you know, if you're doing it in the movies, if you're doing it in the comics, you've got to ground it in some way. Agreed. Before you go into the fantastic uh, mm. elements of it, so it's easier to buy the more fantastic elements. And I think in this context, the the rotoscoping is part of that. You know, the the sort of fluid, natural, human way these characters mm. are moving before they go off and do something fantastic. Then, uh, really, really makes an impact for me. Mm. Yeah, the only times it doesn't look natural, like the motion, is the times when Superman is jumping. Because you can tell they can't work out the physics for that. Mm-hmm. Because like in Mechanical Monsters, he, he, he jumps straight and then he comes back down straight. But it definitely mm-hmm. looks like he's flying. Mm-hmm. And isn't that one of the reasons they asked DC, wasn't it? Um, can we make him fly? Because yeah. they weren't happy with him jumping. Okay. Yeah, like they, it was either too expensive or like it was hard to figure out the physics. But in mm. the third episode, Billion Dollar Limited, he straight up flies, like horizontal flies. Mm. And then for the rest of the series, he's, go- he's back to jumping, except for the Jabba Tours, because that takes place mm. in the air. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was, that was interesting, because like, they just went back and forth on whether or not he flew. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's important to point that out, because you know early on, uh, there were some instances like in in comics and other things where he would almost look like he was floating or whatever, but he never, it was never actually stated that he flew. Mm-hmm. And the first time that happens is in this, in this, uh, 
in this cartoon series. So we have this cartoon series to owe for expanding Superman's power set to where he actually flies, because uh, that hadn't really been explored before. And yeah. uh, you know, one of the reasons, like uh, to back up what what Doy was saying, one of the reasons why at times the a lot of that stuff doesn't doesn't quite uh, match up to the quality of the other stuff. It's real simple. Human beings can't fly. Mm. So, you know, you don't really have a way of like mapping out somebody flying to put it on a tape, you know? Yeah. But um, there's no way to film it first and then trace over it. Just, there's no yeah. Way. Yeah. Yeah. You just you couldn't do it then. And so um, and also, which is important to, to note, because you keep seeing these um, these necessary uh, innovations in technology that are created just to serve these these shows and these movies and these cartoons and then it it leads directly to other things like you don't have to do it now because everything's done in a computer but i don't think people appreciate really like a lot of the stuff that was happening in the first superman movie or even yeah. what it took to make a cartoon like this you know what i mean um like so what i did was i pulled up the patent um because i don't i don't know if 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 anybody knows this but uh Google, like how you have Google Docs and Google Slides and all of that, there's actually um, a Google service where you can pull up patents from the from really? the patent office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I pulled up uh, in pre preparation for this. I pulled up um, the the patent for uh, what it says here: method of producing moving picture cartoons, uh, which invented by Max Fleischer, of course, and um, it also has illustrations that comes with it too. So. Um, so I'm just going to try to find, I'm, I'm only going to read like a, like a couple of passages from it. Um, Cause it's kind of, you know, it's a patent thing. So it's kind of long. So I'll just read the opening. Um, so let's see. Uh, Max Fleischer, Brooklyn, New York, method of production, G moving picture cartoons, application filed December 6, 1915. Uh, approved method of producing moving picture cartoons of which the following is a full clear and exact description animated hand executed pictures uh, or as they are termed moving picture cartoons is now produced by the usual methods are recognized as having their distinctive advantages and uh, desirable features but they usually are not lifelike an object of my invention is to provide a method by which Improved cartoon films may be produced depicting the figures or other objects in a lifelike manner, characteristic of the regular animated photo pictures. In producing cartoon films by my improved method, scenes are enacted by the ad of living actors depicting the subjects to be displayed by the cartoons and through the instrumentality of a moving picture camera, pictures of the enacted scenes are taken and from these pictures, line pictures of or cartoons of the characters or objects to be portrayed are made. The mm. series of cartoons are then photographically reproduced on a film or equivalent medium and the photographs of the cartoons thus obtained are projected on a screen and displayed in the usual manner by any approved motion picture machine. The invention will be particularly explained in the specific description following. And um, I'm not gonna get into all of that. Y'all check the document out. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize you filed a patent for that. Mm hmm Yep. And um and the patent was drafted, like I said, it was actually uh drafted in nineteen fifteen. So obviously this was something that he had an idea for and he was able to take it and work it through and do all of these other things and then ultimately so it wasn't like an overnight thing. And that's kind of the point I'm trying to make. Because it's not like he just was like, Hey, listen. Let's do it like this. Like something like this involves a lot of trial and error. Yeah. Right. Because it's not like you can just open up Adobe Illustrator or something like that or After Effects and you can just do stuff, which you can kind of do that now. Even if you don't have, you don't necessarily need a big budget studio now. If you have time and the skill, you can make your own cartoon if you've got people that can, you know. But those, and um, I also would like people to look up the images of the rotoscoping machines and you'll see that these machines were huge. Like if you look at the ones that uh, Disney used, like, like they were like Snow the White. Of, yeah, yeah, they were crazy. Like they were like huge. They would fill a room and they each would have different cells on them when they would fill a scene and things were constantly doing like this. You know what I mean? And you have uh -huh. you know, six or seven layers of that where things are just kind of moving. That's how they were able to do it. And they would just film it. And yeah, so right. they, would, 
do it time and time again, but the timing has to be right. Because if it's not, the animation is kind of jittery, you know? So it, look, it, it can look really, really bad unless you do it right. So uh, I just want people to kind of understand that in the 1940s, especially, even today doing something like this without the aid of like, um, a, you know, a computer or something like that, uh, a lot of y'all would just was, would fold trying to do something like this. This is highly specialized technical work. And when you watch this, when you watch this uh, show, if you've never absolutely. seen it, yeah, it comes off on the screen like it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It literally looks like somebody made this like, you know, a couple months back and just wanted to make it look old. That's how yeah. it looks. You know, it, it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, um, that, that actually goes towards why there are only 17 episodes of this. Mm -hmm. because this show is expensive to make. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the reasons because it's, it is super highly specialized. Yeah. 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 From what I understand, they, they originally didn't want to make it. The Fleischer brothers. Just, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. So I love that story. <laughs> yeah. They didn't want to make it cause uh, they had too much else on. So they deliberately asked for too much money mm -hmm. and, uh, and like but Paramount were like, yeah, okay, let's do it. And, <laughs> and uh, so they ended up with loads of money to make it. <laughs> mm -hmm. They asked for $100,000 per cartoon and Paramount settled for 50. Uh, supposedly, like that's the equivalent of something like 1.7 million US dollars yeah. mm -hmm. for uh, today, which is insane. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. You know. That's, Let's move on. We, uh, we're going to deal with the, with the voice acting, uh, which, which I think is, is magnificent in this cartoon. Um, and a lot of what makes the, the cartoon work and, and adds to the longevity of it, aside from the technical advancements and the, the pristine animation, is the voice acting. Um, so, uh, uh, Pauly, uh, what you think about it, man? I mean, yeah, generally, I love it. I read that it was um, Bud Collier doing it. Um, yeah, it was. On the radio series. And and it was the same Lois as well. As I'm afraid I can't remember her name, but the lady who played Lois in the radio series was also brought back. For, I don't know if they did the whole run, though, or if they just did a few of them. I think Collier did the whole run. Um... Right. Okay. That's interesting. Because, I mean, he's... I mean, I've listened to quite a few of the radio... Uh, episodes and they're absolutely fantastic he does such a great job with it because like he's i think he's like set the precedent of um in, in a sort of live action production of differentiating between clark kent and superman because mm -hmm. he, he plays clark kent and superman as two completely different people his voice changes noticeably on the radio that doesn't come across as much in the cartoons unfortunately but he still does a great job in it uh, and uh, yeah, yeah sorry sorry to interrupt you they did the whole thing and not only that for the one episode where lois doesn't show up um joan alexander who voices lois voiced the secret agent who was in that show who was in that right episode. that's interesting mm -hmm. okay uh, yeah I mean, she's drawn exactly awesome. like she's drawn exactly like lois except with blonde hair so mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah i mean both of them are fantastic and obviously they both knew the characters inside out by the time yeah. they got around doing the uh the cartoon love yeah. it uh love uh so small bit of trivia uh, the mechanical monsters the second one is the first time Superman has ever changed in a phone booth. Like that's the mm -hmm. first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bud Collier starts off, starts it off with the Clark Kent voice where he goes like, this is a job for, this is a job. And then he comes out and he, he's like for Superman. So he just changes his voice. That's a big thing. Uh, it'll play into something like Batman, the animated series way later on uh, where Kevin Conroy will do it. Um, so, yeah, and I believe that's a cartoon that we will be talking about in a bit when we talk about influence. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you know, an underrated voice for this that I love, and which is my default voice when I'm narrating anything, is the narrator's voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had oh. Faster Than a Speeding Bullet, that whole spiel, was my ringtone for years. 
So when I'm watching the cartoon, there's part of my brain that's still like, the phone's ringing <laughs> whenever, the, whenever a cartoon starts. You know, you know, what's interesting is that the opening is a, is a up in the sky look. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. It's not look up in the sky. It's weird. It's weird because I'm watching, I was watching it earlier, I was marathoning it, and maybe like it was maybe six episodes in, like hearing that when it clicked for me that something was different. But yeah. It was a look up in the sky in the radio serial then, was it? I don't know, but th- th- that's just the, that's just the ubiquitous one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And um, one thing too, like what you were saying about the narrator, um, you know how we were talking about the uh, the correlation between the Popeye stuff and the Superman stuff. Another thing, um, the guy from the radio, the narrator from the radio, Jackson Beck, he's also the voice of, of Bluto in the um, oh. in the new in the stuff that um, the other studio uh, put together. Um, and uh, there's actually an episode of Popeye where Bluto dresses up like Superman. <laughs> that's interesting yeah I watched that one this morning, actually, oh did you like, yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's funny because uh he's doing all of these these feats of strength and stuff and then he's like oh yeah only superman could do this kind of stuff you know and you know olive oil she just kind of goes oh you know you know the typical thing you know what i mean but yeah it's it's funny it's, it's funny and it's, it's interesting too yeah. yeah um and um they use parts of the uh the score from from the the cartoon in in the Popeye show, you know, <laughs> like whenever Bluto shows up, yeah, it's crazy. Um, so we're gonna go. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning, the uh, methods of storytelling and, and plot. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about, uh, which Paulie hinted on it earlier, about the difference in in tone and and storytelling techniques. Um, so, uh, uh, Paulie, I'm gonna let you start. Yeah, I mean, like the first nine basically have the same plot <laughs> in the um exactly mad side the same plot exactly the yeah. same plot. <laughs> lois gets in trouble uh there's a there's a there's a plot lois yeah. gets in trouble because she's sniffing out a story superman shows up in like the last three minutes yeah absolutely and um and then clark kent has a good old laugh with Lois at the end, yeah, winking at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas then, as soon as like they become the famous studios cartoons, they start mixing up the plots a bit, and they make a more kind of wartime propaganda. And um, and yeah, and like I said, that's a real mixed bag because you get these much more interesting plots. Like for example, the eleventh hour where it starts and they're already in Japan, and yeah. or like the last one where um, it all revolves like Lois isn't in it, but it all revolves around that spy lady um, trying to escape with some mm-hmm. documents from um, Nazi spies, and um, but then the flip side of that is because it's propaganda, you get everything that comes with propaganda, wartime propaganda. There, you get the the really dodgy racism. <laughs> Adolf Adolf Hitler makes a cameo at the end of Jungle Drums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's yeah. Uh, he gets really angry listening to the radio, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is it, it? It is funny how they save him for the end because, like, you know, when once you you find out almost immediately that the cartoon is about the Nazis, right? Yeah. And then so you're like, okay, where does dude at? This is in the 40s, you know? So it's like, where this guy at? And he pops up at the end and it's like, gotcha. You know, so it's just funny how they do little stuff like that. Cause it's like, oh, it's at the end. It's too late now. You can't do nothing about it. You know what I mean? So, um, but uh, this is also something that I wanted to point out in regards to that is that for these people that try to make it like, you know, this stuff has never been political and now all of a sudden it's political all of a sudden, right? Always. It's like, it's like, have you ever read a comic, right? Like, did you just start reading them yesterday or something? Because like Superman's first appearance, like he's literally going around beating up politicians. So it's like, it doesn't get more political than that. Uh, than also, manhandling politicians. Yeah. Also, if you think about it, the way Krypton, the way Krypton meets its end it's mm-hmm. about people not listening to the scientist. Yeah. And yeah. even though it was done in 1938, 
the fact that it resonates now politically is not its fault, but it's still political. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's just the way, this is the way we're going. Come on, people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because uh, not listening to smart people is, uh, it's a bit of a problem today. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you know how it goes. You know, the, uh, the, the folks you went, you went to school in seventh grade with, uh, they the ones that got the whole thing figured out, you know, not yeah. the people who actually dedicated their lives to the stuff. But uh, yeah, so, uh, but it's, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll tell you what episode I love from the Famous Studios uh, run, because mm-hmm. uh, you've got all of these stories that are either wartime propaganda or sci-fi stuff, and all of a sudden you've got Showdown, which is just about a dude <laughs> who's who's impersonating Superman and like yeah. stealing jewelry. <laughs> it's just the most <laughs> ridiculous lopsided fight <laughs> ever. Yeah, yeah. What, right. <laughs> what I love about that one is that when he's at the opera stealing everyone's jewelry, He's Clark is sleeping, Superman, but he's still sneaking around and doesn't want to be seen. And then he's really not, uh, disappointed when he is seen. So why are you dressed as Superman? <laughs> right, right. You know, yeah, because when, when you, you know, it's like nobody knows who you are any other time. So it yeah. seems like if you don't want to draw attention Great. to yourself, just do the other thing, right? Like, it's, yeah. it's just like you can group all of these cartoons into two things. It's like it's either sci-fi stuff or terrorist stuff, terrorist slash war stuff. And then all of a sudden there's showdown. It yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's really interesting seeing wartime propaganda from the perspective of someone who's lives in the United Kingdom though. Cause I sort of grew up learning in school about sort of uh, British wartime propaganda. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was very focused on the Germans and the Italians. Whereas like, the more immediate threat to the states with the Japanese. So it's really strange to see it all focused towards the Japanese rather than the Germans. And mm-hmm. also the sort of difference in tone, like um, even though they do depict the Japanese as these absurd caricatures and they're kind of making fun of them, there's, uh, you get more of a sense of it being an insidious threat creeping at you from within if you're not careful. And that's very American, that is, I think. That's mm-hmm. very sort of... Um, indicative yeah. of the united states or we got to be vigilant for these sort of threats yeah whereas that uh, i don't know maybe i'm wrong but there didn't seem to be as much as that in sort of british wartime propaganda i mean there was a bit of it but it was more about sort of ridiculing them and making them look ridiculous in yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. british wartime yeah. propaganda here's yeah. what i'll say as racist as the japanese depictions are here the japatours uh the it's not as racist as the comics were <laughs> nowhere near and, and, nowhere you know, near yeah you could argue that they didn't have they didn't have as much time to cultivate <laughs> <laughs> you know but uh I, i'm gonna give y'all a bit of kind of uh tri- trivia here um you know we were talking about how there's this blend here of the political stuff and the wartime stuff and the science fiction stuff uh we actually see these sentiments play out in real life because um have any, either of you ever heard of a book called chariots of the gods yeah. Y'all ever heard of that? Okay. So, you know, it was, it was written by a guy named Eric Von Daniken, right? And okay. And he was one of the first people that was pushing this whole thing about uh, the ancient alien theory and how we had all of this, these extraterrestrials that came in and, you know, created Stonehenge and, and built the pyramids and Kemet and all of that kind of stuff, right? Now, the interesting thing about that, and these people that make these claims and say that this stuff is real, I always hit them with this and the conversation's over. Now, Eric Von Daniken was such a horrible writer. He had a guy who was his editor, right? And by the, when he gave his book to his editor, his editor basically said his book is garbage. So his editor rewrote the entire book and let him keep his name on it. All right, right. yeah. So, so what happened is the important thing, though, was who the editor was. The editor was a, a guy named Wilhelm Uterman. Now, he was known as Oots Uterman, you know, and the interesting thing about it is that he was a journalist for a German newspaper uh, previously, you know, which he ultimately had to give that job up because the Third Reich failed, right? Gotcha. And the paper that he worked for was the paper in Nazi Germany. So the guy who actually propagated this whole ancient alien stuff was actually a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, and so, you of know, of course it was. 
Yeah. So once you know that, since he was the guy that wrote the book and you know so it's like yo Absolutely. that argument there's no way that argument is not a racist argument just based on that because these people can never get around that you know what i mean <laughs> like there's no way you can get around it you're pushing nazi propaganda when you say that so i just wanted to throw that out there for people just just to kind of see how pervasive a lot of this stuff really is still you know um yeah. and how you know things like this do have an impact on the way people see the world you know uh, especially when it's well done like you know, this like the, how magnificent this cartoon is, you know, it's used for both good and bad, you know. So, uh, yeah. S if it, <laughs> Speaking of impact, yeah. the next item on your agenda here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about cultural impact and influence. Um, um, I got a few things I, I, I want to say, but uh, though I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you start on this one. I, I just got a couple things. Um, it took a long time. I think for, for the influence to be felt, mm -hmm. but Batman, the animated series is clearly influenced by Fleischer Superman. Like there's no yeah. question about it. Uh, yeah. They like, there's a documentary out on YouTube now called heart of ice. I want no, it's not heart of ice, whatever it is. I'll link to it here. But Bruce, Tim was saying that he was actually trying really hard to not make it look like Fleischer Superman. Cause he wanted to have his own spin to it. And then somebody told him, you know what the show should look like? This, should, this show should look like Fleischer Superman. Like, oh, yeah, it really should. And then uh, Kevin Altieri, one of the directors, saw the first, uh, you know, the first trailer for it. And he was like, holy crap, we're making Fleischer Superman. And he's like, yeah, we are. So that's it. And I don't have to talk about how Batman, the, anim the animated series, changed the face of, the face of animation. Definitely. Uh, the other yeah. thing that this was an influence on is a small movie from 2004 called Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, which is the mechanical monsters are in it. But even though no one ever talks about that movie now, it was the first mm -hmm. all CGI live action movie. Yeah. And therefore, it's a game changer. So the, the reach and influence of this thing is... Is, is is unmatched yeah yeah Polly, is, is you um, on me yeah uh it's interesting uh watching the superman animated series now um because a common criticism of superman the animated series and the justice league cartoons is how um underpowered superman is and how he's always sort of getting his uh getting his back kicked and I always kind of like thought that was because they were riffing on Superman in the sort of late eighties, early nineties comics with John Bernard underpowered Superman a bit. Yeah. And so I thought that was their influence, but watching these uh, 1940s cartoons, I realized that that's the Fleischer influence because in those, uh, in those 1940s cartoons, Superman is in peril in every episode and the, the way you talked earlier Doy, about him trying to guide the bulleteer's car with his strength and it's a struggle for him to do so and i see now that's what they're trying to do in superman the animated series and as you say that doesn't necessarily work in a shared universe and maybe that is perhaps one of the flaws then once they started putting superman in the justice league cartoons i feel like it works when he's alone yeah, it works when he's alone, but in the Justice League cartoons, then yeah, it, it, you know, it, Superman doesn't really stand out from any in, of the other. In cartoons. the Justice League cartoon, when they're out in space, he's the only one with a spacesuit, and like Captain Adam is out there, like uh, or and, and like all these other guys. I'm like that. That, <laughs> that to me is when you feel. But but if Superman were alone and like you're working only with the rules of Superman, and you want him wearing a spacesuit, that I get. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. But it's very interesting to me that that was a Fleischer influence so long, and I never realized it until recently. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. You know, a, a thing that I, I think is, is interesting about the, the impact and the influence of this cartoon is that, you know, when we put it into perspective of the 40s, these cartoons would come on like before movies and things. So that's why you have the short length in addition to how expensive they were to make. So it was common for those who are maybe a little younger and don't know, uh, during this time, it was common for cartoons to be shown during movies. That's how you get all these raunchy Warner Brothers cartoons that you can't show in full anymore because, you know, adults were going to this stuff. So 
uh, by this time, Superman was still a particularly new concept because uh, we were only, you know, a few years removed from his debut. So a lot of it was just kind of still looked at as like, for the most part, you know, it was still something that like kids dealt with and stuff like that, even though you did have adults who read comics and things. But uh, I think this particular cartoon, probably even more so than a lot of the early serials, put it in a place where like adults would enjoy it too and genuinely enjoy it just like they enjoyed it just like their children enjoyed it and a lot of that i think has to do with the way that that they utilized like if you go back into action comics number one we were talking before on another on another tape we were talking about how motion was conveyed because in that in that first issue superman is constantly in motions yeah and this this cartoon is like that so like whenever he's super Superman, um, he kind of like hits the ground running. He's like a freight train, you know. He yeah. he hits the ground running and he works himself up uh, to a fever pitch, and he just keeps going, you know. So like even when he gets knocked down or something's pushing him back, it's like as soon as he meets a force of resistance, he's immediately acting against it, you know. Um, and it's really compelling to watch, which you know, like we were talking about how he's punching the lasers and stuff, you know, because at first he's kind of struggling with it, and he's like, "Man, this ain't working." Bam, bam, bam. You know what I mean? So it's just like he's constantly reacting to situations with action, and being able to see it play out like this, it, you could definitely see that it influenced other things. Um, even when we get to the Christopher Reeve Superman, um, he said that you know, and he he said I I never really read comic books when I was growing up, you know, because I was into other things. And uh, he was like, I knew who Superman was, but I didn't know that much about him. So, but he said that he had seen these Max Fleischer uh, cartoons. And it seems like um, Bud Collier doing the vocal transformation uh, helped him in portraying Superman as this guy that's always Superman, but he's playing Clark Kent. So he actually was playing a person who was playing a person, right? You know? Yeah. Um, and so you have these bridges of these storytelling ideas that are still viable, you know? And that's why a lot of times, like we in the era of like jobbing characters out now, that's why a lot of that stuff isn't convincing because when you grow up and you see these cartoons and, and stuff like that, and you read these books and this guy is constantly in motion and he's reacting to everything. That's part of his character. So when you see him get hit and he goes and he falls over and doesn't move and you're like, man, come on, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know? So I, I think that's a bit of, of cultural impact and influence that we still feel uh, today. You know, there's this uh, one sequence. I think it's in the mechanical monsters. Uh, Lois is tied up and is about to be dropped in a, vat of lava yeah the mechanical mm -hmm. monsters so superman jumps saves her the lava is about to come down so lava comes down superman spreads out his cape and protects her and then the next thing you know the mad scientist is about to jump off the ledge and i guess commit suicide because it all got, got put in jail and as he's jumping superman just jumps right into the screen and grabs him off the ledge and mm -hmm. then he just jumps and they go back home. Mm -hmm. And it's just like motion after motion after motion. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 It's, it's absolutely insane the way that they were able to convey this guy doing these things. Because if he's just kind of standing there and then he does something and then he stands there for a bit more and then he goes to do something. But it's like, you know, there's a sense of urgency there. And because this is not like the, the invulnerable Superman that can you know, sneeze galaxies away and stuff like that. Like we hadn't had that yet, yeah. but this, this guy, like Paulie said, he's always in danger in some kind of way. So, uh, cause it seems like the threats for him escalate as the show goes along. So, um, you know, so for him to actually do that with the lava and then spread the Cape out and like, and he's good to go. And he's not even like getting up limping or flinching or anything like that was big for that time, Amazing. you know? Because uh, they actually expanded his power set when they did that. And I don't know if it was intentional or not, because it could have just been like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you did this? Because you get a lot of ideas like that that are great. So it could have been that. But yeah, that particular thing, like, like that whole sequence, man, at, you know, with that as the show wraps up, is just fantastic. Like, yeah. I, I think if you're studying animation, this is a show. Oh, you like have you, to. You got to, mm. man. You have to. You have to. This yeah. is a must watch. All right. Um. 
we got uh, the other thing uh, I wanted to talk about next to the last thing is the longevities of the characters and the story elements, as well as like the technical aspects, which we've covered some of it already. Um, uh, Paulie, you got it, bro. So we're talking about the, the characters now. The, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you kind of get a Jimmy Olsen character pop up in a couple of episodes. Mm -hmm. that quite surprised Yeah, you me. do. Yeah. <laughs> he's, not, he's not Jimmy. No, he's yeah. not Jimmy, but he's, he's like this little guy in a bow tie. I think he calls himself Lewis. In, uh, yeah. There's a gag there. I'm not Lois, I'm Lewis. So. <laughs> So it's interesting to me that like this little sort of Jimmy character, uh, but not Jimmy, turns up at this point in Superman's history, almost as if you know there was a spot for him ready mm -hmm. before he'd actually been introduced. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and it, what Dave was saying earlier on about like uh, Lex Luthor as well, Luthor's not in it, but it's almost like his spot is there waiting for him. Yeah, like so many mad like, scientists, so many. Yeah. yeah, so it's really interesting how like it's almost like everything to do with Superman was out there already, and it was just up to these creators to discover these aspects bit by bit and piece it together. You know who was there, fully formed, hmm. right there from the start, Lois Lane. Yeah, really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like mm -hmm. uh, the. It's basically the prototype for how you should portray Lois Lane. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, another thing in terms of longevity of the characters is, you know, there's a debate about how you would want to see Clark Kent portrayed, whether you portray him as the clumsy Christopher Reeve type or you portray him as the more hard-boiled reporter type. And I think I lean strongly towards the, the latter. And a lot of it is because of this cartoon. Um, and a lot of it is because the only way you can pull off the other one is if you're Christopher Reeve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no one else has ever ever really been able to get it. Uh, even the comics, like Frank Whiteley's been able to do it. Uh, Gary Frank's kind of been able to do it. But like, I think there's just more mileage in a more noirish, hard-boiled Clark Kent. And the hard-boiled one is the version George Reeves was playing as well on TV yeah. in the fifties. Mm -hmm. He was he was playing this cartoon Clark Kent, you know, with the sort of fedora, big fedora pushed back at the back of his head, and yeah, yeah, and sort of chuckling yeah. at Lois, kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I might be in the minority on this one, but I, I think his Clark Kent was better than his Superman. George Reeves, uh, George, George Reeves, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you might be right. Probably, there. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, probably uh, uh, from the from the from what I remember seeing of him, I might be in the minority on this one. But in this cartoon, I feel like the Clark Kent scenes are better than the Superman scenes. I could no, I could I could see that, I could mm. see that because, and I'm gonna tell you why I say that because I kind of feel like while he's doing his Clark Kent stuff, you get this feeling of like there's this this. Um, you know, we talk about this constant movement. So whenever he's doing the Clark Kent stuff, it's like that movement and that, that sense of action and urgency is just bubbling, waiting to get out. Uh, yeah, you know, so, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so it's brilliant how they save the Superman stuff for like the last two, three minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's yeah. exactly it's what you're mentioning. It's like it bubbles up and then like Superman shows up. It's just the perfect mm -hmm. payoff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's and every, everything in Clark Kent's demeanor in these cartoons and in the George Reeves ones as well, everything about the way he's talking, the tone he's using, he's in on this joke and we're in on it with him. Yeah, he and winks right at us. Yeah, yeah he, mm -hmm. he literally winks at us. Like, but yeah. you know, the way he's speaking and his body language, it's all conveying this. I, I, yeah, you know, you know. <laughs> the audience you know yeah yeah <laughs> you don't know yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny how we don't think about it but yeah superman's probably the first comic book character to break the fourth wall we don't really think about it like that mm. you know yeah yeah he probably is you know because the mm. only way he breaks the fourth wall is he just winks at you that's it mm -hmm. yeah. that's it you know um 
Because this cartoon and, is so good, guys. It's, it's so yeah, good. It's insane how good it is, man. It it really, really, really is. And uh, and I think the most understated aspect of it is that somehow or another, even though Superman was was young as a character, they really got Superman. Like the people that were writing it and everything that was everything like the animators got Superman, the people who created the uh, sceneries and did the movements for the for the animation, all of that. They got Superman. The writers got Superman. You know, dude, I'll do you one better. I'll do you one better. It's not even that they got Superman. They defined Superman. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Because the depictions here, especially with Lois Lane, um, uh, we can tell that. Noel Neal's performance as Lois Lane, who I think she's probably, when you talk about a body of work, she's probably my favorite Lois. Yeah. Because, um, you know, kind of, she kind of has the same deal. Uh, she, she, she doesn't take crap off people. Uh, she does her job in a, in a very, in a very, um, like, uh, forward manner. And she gets into a lot of trouble because of it. It's obviously that she's not, she's not, um, she's not lacking intellect. And the people around her respect her, you know, and and all of that, you know what I mean? So whenever whenever she's getting the raw deal, she's getting it from a villain and that line is directly drawn, you know, and it's it's almost always because of her intellect. It's like, you know, like, yo, you shouldn't have figured this out. So let me show you what we do to people like you. Right. (laughs) But, you know, so, um, you know, and just thinking that in those times in the 40s and the 50s, that's you know, that's like that's it's a really big deal. So um, usually I try not to, whenever people are talking about how, you know, you have these things that are being pushing forward, you know, for like female characters in comics and things like that, there's a hint of truth to that. But also it's more so of the case that that precedence was, had already been set by Lois Lane. Um, I think even more so in a lot of ways than Wonder Woman. Because, mm-hmm. but... Um, I see it. I see yeah, what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, um, and I don't think she gets enough credit as a as a character for that, mostly because of how she was treated subsequently. You know, yeah. And and that's a fair assessment. But I always just let people know, nah, um, because in her first years as a character, everything that you think she should be now, or everything she is now, she was already that, and it was stripped from her. You know. Yeah. Agree. You think of it as like, oh, America and the West, we've been we've been learning these things and we didn't know these things decades mm-hmm. ago. And mm-hmm. it's like, no, we knew these things, but people thought deliberately to take these things away, you know? Mm-hmm. But yeah. we already knew them. Like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you know. And and I think too that that's a big joy in watching this in watching this show is actually seeing these things play out and um just seeing how even when the plots are just absolutely ridiculous, the character, um, the way the characters are treated is, yeah. is just fantastic. It's, it's just, just yeah. wonderful. It's a wonderful yeah. uh, iteration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. This show is crazy. As you can see, we all fans of this show. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, I like the last thing I wanted to close with before the closing remarks is um, where do you think – uh, this iteration of Superman ranks just like across across media, you know, because that you know you got Superman. I'm talking like radio, movies, television, comics, just or just any other iteration of Superman that you could possibly think of. So here's the thing, I uh, I told you I was reading Superman Smashes the Clan, and mm-hmm. in it, that has this Superman. It at least starts off with a Superman. Mm-hmm. Uh, he can't he can't fly. He doesn't have vision powers, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. And I feel like there's mileage in that kind of character today. It's just that it wouldn't be Superman. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, it yeah, just doesn't yeah. work. Uh, it, it, it won't work as the leader of the DC universe. It just, it, he doesn't work that way anymore. He has to be more powerful in everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for that reason, therefore, this cartoon is a time capsule. Mm-hmm. But like quality wise, it's just so aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I find like very few flaws in it. So it's yeah. uh, so it's way up there. It's just hard to compare because it's such it's such an innovation. Mm-hmm. So everything since then has been a refinement of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but 
it's probably my favorite Superman cartoon. It probably is, actually. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the same. Yeah, it's probably my favorite Superman cartoon. Although I, I do love the Ruby Spears one as well. But in yeah. terms of like just quality and influence and what it's inspired over the years, you just can't beat the Fleischer cartoons. Yeah, um, for me, it's aesthetically. Just, yeah, aesthetically, yeah. definitely. I mean, they're absolutely beautiful. And um, I think one of the reasons not a lot of people know about them, weirdly, is because they're so easy to get hold of. And that sounds really strange, but because I think um, yeah. some aspects of them is public domain, yeah. Yeah. you kind of get cheap VHSs of them in like garages and you get like, um, you know, they're, they're all like on YouTube and they're all on the internet and they're all really easy to get hold of. And oh, that's that, cool. I'll watch it later. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're kind of disposable. Yeah. Yeah. And for that reason as well, Warner Brothers isn't like bringing out our oh, deluxe box set of the f innovative Fleischer cartoons, you know? They're no, it extra. would make them no money. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. They're an extra on the Superman Blu-ray box set, which yeah. is great, you know? I, yeah. I mean, it's fantastic to get all these cartoons as an extra. I couldn't believe yeah. it when I bought the Blu-ray yeah. myself. But at the same time, they're not getting publicized as the influential innovative thing that they are mm -hmm. and they're, they're very easily forgotten yeah and unfortunately it's weird that the more accessible they are the more forgotten they are <laughs> in a way mm -hmm. and i wonder if we're looking at superman in the future there you know i wonder if we're looking in, in a few decades time when superman's public domain and warner brothers aren't so interested in pushing him as a property anymore you know, nobody talks about Popeye really anymore. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's what's going to happen to Superman overall in a few decades. That's quite a depressing that's a, thought. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. It's also an interesting idea to see if he goes public domain and see what other people would be able to do with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the one that would be public domain is that Superman. Yeah. And yeah. that would be very interesting to me. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I think... You know, like you said, I think, uh, though you put it perfectly when you said it's a, it's a time capsule. Um, and the Superman that was in this series, uh, at its best, it served the purpose that needed to be served at the time it was created. And what happens is ultimately, it's just like anything else, you look back on it and you bring those things forward. You know, like uh, for me, you know, people like I tend to just in, in a general sense in my own personal life, I, I tend to not trust people that say you never look back. Right. It's like that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You know, you look back often, but you keep going forward, you know. And so this particular uh, cartoon, the reason why we have what we have now, you know, for better or for worse, is because people kept moving forward, but they look back, you know, because you can trace a clear line between this Superman and the the 1938 Superman. Then you can trace one into the George Reeves stuff. And then you can trace one into the Christopher Reeves stuff and then so on and so forth. You know what I mean? Uh, so not just for Superman, because you can trace it into Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. Yeah, absolutely. You can yeah, then yeah. trace into Batman, mm -hmm. the animated series. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. It, it covers th this particular Superman covers pretty much every base that you can think of. And I'll go out on a limb and say that all of the best iteration of Superman that like that really are pure veyers of what his strong points are as a character and things like that. Um, a lot of them have the Fleischer Superman as their springboard in some yeah, kind of way. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So, um, but we also know that uh, the way that, and that usually happens when you have a concept that creates this bigger thing. Um, sometimes the bigger thing doesn't work with the thing that that gave it the uh context you know yeah. so uh like you said um you know the superman nowadays um him trying to stop a train with his hands you know and the train doesn't just automatically stop that's probably not going to work anymore you know um you know and things like that because th this guy was basically the circus strong man who could actually do the things he purported he could do yeah you know so um i, th I think that it's very important uh, just like anything else, just like, you know, it's important for young people 
to kind of you don't just throw uh you don't just throw your grandparents away you know what i mean so even even when your grandparents get get older they still have value because they stay home with the children and they teach so i think that this particular um this particular superman uh in just the early days of superman uh when he was doing the things where allegedly he wasn't you know, somehow or another today, he wasn't a political figure or a political character, you know, uh, that particular Superman. And, you know, there's a lot that is still that can still resonate today just with and we know that because Grant Morrison recreated this Superman for his fan for his action comics run. You know what I'm saying? So so we know it's viable. You yes. could make the argument that's the best uh, story that DC has put out in the past 10 years, you know, so um and it's definitely that, the best new 52 story i'll tell you that oh Absolutely. i don't think it's a question yeah i don't <laughs> think it's a question because that book is amazing um and just and but it also shows the love for the character you know because yeah. it's very clear that like even you know like when we talk about how um like somebody like alan moore deconstructs these superheroes and things like that but it's because he's able to do it because he loves them exactly so it's like there's nothing wrong with them being what they are like it's almost like like Watchmen in a lot of ways is just like hey listen when you take away all that stuff this is what you get and it ain't good, right? So you know and that's the part a lot of these people miss you know when they try to be like oh no you, you should be doing it like this and yeah. Superman should be killing people and stuff like that and it's like no there's reasons why that stuff doesn't work but um but yeah uh I guess we're gonna uh, close out with the final remarks and if there's anything that we didn't say today. <laughs> If that's possible, because we we covered a lot of ground, um, I, I'm I'm gonna give it to y'all, um, uh, Paulie. You got it, man. I think something I didn't cover is uh, I just wanted to reiterate or, or reemphasize what some one of you guys said about Terra at the Midway, and mm. how great that one is, the one at the circus. And yeah. the reason I love that one that I didn't mention earlier is when the gr everyone's in the big top doing their thing, the trapeze artists are on the high wire and the clowns are juggling, the lions are roaring, and then the gorilla comes into the tent and they all stop, even though lions, <laughs> like this sort of unwanted relative has turned up at a barbecue <laughs> without any, turned up at the family barbecue. Oh no, it's the uncle that we don't like. <laughs> Like, who invited this dude, man? Yeah, like the ghost of the piece. Just the gorilla. This cartoon is awesome. Yeah, and even the lions are like, what? I choose to believe with rotoscoping, they actually filmed these. Yes. Anyway, yeah. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that bit because I love it. Lamar? Um, well, um, let me show y'all something, man. Now y'all know this, but uh, see this right here. I, my VCR, my pop, peace be upon him. Uh, he gave me that VCR when I graduated high school in in '97, and it still works, right? Um, so I pulled this out to review for this, and this is basically all the cartoons. It's um, it's uh, you know, about it says 150 minutes, uh, and um, you know, like, you know. I, like I do this for real, right? And you gotta understand, like you talk about the VCR and the Betamax and all of that. That's like my that's my stuff, right? Like, and I wanted to capture what it was like for me as a child watching this stuff. So I was like, let me just pull out, see if I got still got this VHS, and I still got it. The VHS still works. I don't know how, cause I be, I like I wore this tape out. It shouldn't work, right? <laughs> so so um, it's magic. Yeah, man. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's some of that uh Fleischer Brothers physics at, at play. <laughs> but yeah, man, um this cartoon is absolutely fantastic. Um and it's very easy for children to get into, you know. Um and it's just something I think that if if you have children, um and you grew up with this like I did. Like, I don't have any children. I, one of the reasons why I wish I had children is so I could watch this with them, you know. Uh, this cartoon has left an indelible mark on pop culture and in a lot of ways on the, 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 um, 
the consciousness of the public in ways that most people don't realize. I agree. And it's for all the right reasons because the junk has kind of fallen away from it over time. You know, like what we were talking about, about a lot of the other, the other craziness, you know, but the stuff that's great about it is still viable. It still works. It's still entertaining. And, and it's funny how it ended up being a, a harbinger for, you know, what we got to deal with now in a lot of ways, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. you know, cause some, you know, cause some of these things just do not change, you know, um, they just throw a new coat of paint on it. But, um, yeah, man, um, I strongly recommend, like I said, I think a lot of these, you know, they're in the public domain now, I think in some kind of way, but, uh, so you can watch them on YouTube. I think they're all on YouTube. Uh, if I recall, um, please check them out. Um, and, um, this is, this is, yeah, this is how I'm going to close this. Uh, everybody watching this, as I point my finger up right now, there's a suggested playlist that says Fleischer Superman cartoons. You have no reason and no excuse not to watch this series. Go watch it. Please click like, share, and subscribe. Thank you, everyone.